when forces in the world threaten us, when our bodies or spirits turn against us, there is one who seeks us, one who heals us, This one is the Lord. The geography of sin is a waterless waste, but God gives springs of living water, streams of justice and mercy splashing into the wilderness from the mountain of God. Let us drink deeply of Christ. Let us confess our sin. Holy One, God Most High, grant us faith to confess our sins and seek your mercy. There are barren places in our lives where we have wandered far from you. We have listened to voices who distracted us from your call. We have submitted to powers competing for our loyalty to you. We have not taken the hand you offer to lead us out of God-forsakenness and into your holy ways. God, our Savior, forgive us. Quench our thirst for you from the rock of our salvation and let your love well up in us unto eternal life. Speak tenderly to us of your presence. Feed us with your word, deliver us from evil, let us enter into your kingdom. Then send us out to serve you by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ Jesus is the bread of life, manna come down from heaven. Christ covers us with baptismal water so that our lives are hidden in him. This Jesus, the Son of the Most High, is sovereign even over the powers of evil so that his reign brings freedom and joy. Therefore, I declare to you by the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus Christ that our sins are indeed forgiven. Amen. Forgiven by God and experiencing God's peace, let us now extend that peace to one another. Peace, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Holy, holy, holy ones, your words feed us, your word frees us, and the Spirit gives us life. Grant our ears an appetite for hearing, and our spirits strength for loving you. Amen. The story you're about to hear comes right after the story of Jesus calming the storm, moving from known territory with his disciples to the unknown for them, moving from uh, home turf to a place that frightened the disciples. Some suggest that the, the storm itself was actually a manifestation of their fears of what it meant to go to the Gentiles and to bring the good news there. They have landed on the shore and that is where we find ourselves at the beginning of Mark's fifth chapter. Listen for the word of God. Jesus and his disciples came to the other side of the lake, to the region of the Gerasenes. As soon as Jesus got out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out of the tombs. This man lived among the tombs and no one was ever strong enough to restrain him, even with a chain. He had been secured many times with leg irons and chains, but he broke the chains and smashed the leg irons. No one was tough enough to control him. Night and day in the tombs and the hills, he would howl and cut himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from far away, he ran and knelt before him shouting, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. 
He said this because Jesus had already commanded him, unclean spirit, come out of the man. Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he responded, legion is my name because we are many. They pleaded with Jesus not to send them out of that region. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside. Send us into the pigs, they begged. Let us go into the pigs. Jesus gave them permission, so the unclean spirits left the man and went into the pigs. Then the herd of about 2,000 pigs rushed down the cliff into the lake and drowned. Those who tended the pigs ran away and told the story in the city and in the countryside. People came to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man who used to be demon-possessed. They saw the very man who had been filled with many demons sitting there, fully dressed and completely sane. And they were filled with awe. Those who had actually seen what had happened to the demon-possessed man told the others about the pigs. Then they pleaded with Jesus to leave their region. Now, while Jesus was climbing into the boat, the one who had been demon-possessed pleaded with Jesus to let him come along as, as one of his disciples. But Jesus wouldn't allow it. Go home. To your own people, Jesus said, and tell them what the Lord has done for you and how he has shown you mercy. The man went away and began to proclaim in the ten cities all that Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. This is the story of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So there are two major responses to what Jesus has done for this man, how Jesus has healed him. And the first is that the people who have both been there to witness it as it was happening and the people who have come to see and been uh, in total awe when they, when they see the man, he is fully clothed, he has his wits about him. Um, the, the first response on their part is to ask him to leave. I think we forget sometimes that uh, Jesus in all of his goodness and glory was not well favored um, even when he was doing amazing, wonderful, miraculous things. He represented uh, a shift in how power was supposed to function and work and a threat to the powers that be. So, so the best thing for him to do in this new place, in this region of the Gentiles, where he had not done ministry yet, is to go home, is to leave their region and not cause any more trouble. The healing of the man the ridding him of the demons who are named Legion, which is probably not a coincidence. Legion was the name of, uh, of the armies of the Roman Empire. Some have theorized that his ailment was actually uh, oppression from the powers of the day. But that's not the main uh, response that I want to think about today. The second response is, of course, the response of the man who has been healed, the man formerly known as Legion. As Jesus is about to leave with his disciples, he says, let me come along. I, too, want to be a disciple. And Jesus says, no. When I started thinking about that, I thought, well, that's, that's kind of rude that Jesus would say no. He's all about 
drop everything and follow me. Instead, he, he turns to him and says, no, go back to your people, to the place where you came from. This is also the place that he had, was exiled from, where he had to, to leave because he was uh, demon ridden. Go back to that place and tell them what has happened to you. It occurs to me that Jesus has given this, told this man to go back to his people. Um, the, the man has recognized him or the demons recognized him as, as God the Most High. So he knew who Jesus was. Um, but, that's, but that's all we know. Jesus doesn't sit him down with a catechism. He doesn't give him best practice, practices. He doesn't require knowledge and, and particular orthodoxy. He's not even Jewish. All he knows is that Jesus is son of God the Most High and that Jesus has healed him. And that's all he needs to know according to Jesus' actions right now, right then, uh, to go back to his people and be a witness, be a bringer of the good news, which might put me out of a job. I was just struck by how little he had to do in order to be a proclaimer of the good news. And maybe because many things are always on my heart and mind, maybe because I have ADD, the other thing that was going on in my head at this time was a, a lecture that I heard in 2019 at the next church conference that I know I mentioned in our uh, worship services uh, right after that time. It was, a, it was given by a man named Corey Greaves, who was a co-founder of an organization called Mending, we Mending Wings. He is Native American, and he works largely with Native American youth. And that was, I guess, what the the talk was about, but what struck me was the beginning of the talk. And so I am going to play a clip for that of that for you right now. So listen to the words of Corey Greaves. I was about seven years old when I got, um, when I got baptized. And uh, I remember, I, I, I'm 40, what am I, 48 now. And I still remember that day. Uh, I remember a, a promise that was made to me on that day. And I never forgot it. I remember I, I, went to, I grew up in this fundamentalist academy, right? <laughs> and uh, so I remember sitting down in the front rows and this pastor telling me, um, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> and now that I'm 48, I realize when do any of us really know what we're doing? Um, but I was like, yeah. But I remember something he said. He said, Yeshua said this. I love to use Jesus' tribal name. Please don't forget Christianity is tribal roots. <laughs> and he said, no one will ever be able to pluck you out of my father's hand. Oh, man, I don't know what it was about seven years old, but that meant something to me, right? So I held on to that and have never forgotten that. And so, but... So that was really cool, right? So in my little pea brain, it was such a simple thing following Yeshua at that age. It was simple to me. But as I grew up, I later found out that now I had to become a Christian. <laughs> See, and I found out that those were kind of two different realities. And that's where things began to get really complicated for me because someone said, well, now you need to be a Calvinist. And someone said, no, 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 an Armenian. And somebody else said, no, no, you have to be a Pentecostal. No, a Presbyterian. No, a Methodist. No, a Lutheran. On and on it went. An Anglican, I remember that one. So I grew up attending all these different uh, denominations who all had this, you know, kind of right way to follow Yeshua. And then comes Bible college. Right? So I show up at Lincoln Christian University, well, it was Lincoln Christian College at that time, but Lincoln Christian University in Lincoln, Illinois, uh, carrying my NIV, and, and I started my Bible college journey. Now, during that seven years, because I was on the seven-year program at LCU, uh, I was told that the Bible had some things to say about my native culture that I didn't know before. 
Uh, so I was told that the Bible said things like this, touch not the unclean thing, uh, come out from among them and be separate. Uh, when we are in Christ, the old has passed away and behold, all things have become white, new. <laughs> what fellowship does light have with darkness, right? So all those things, what that meant to me, how I read it was that I needed to leave my Indian ways behind me because I now have a new identity in Christ and it was not Indian. And the Bible has been used to demonize just about everything important to our cultural sense of being. And so while Yeshua found me at this young age of seven, the church began to lose me at the age of 19. And so the stuff that I learned at that time really set me on this journey of realizing that Christianity has never really been good news uh, to us as native people. So one of the things that I learned, uh, we started with this guy. So in 1492, when we discovered old Chris out there floating around and lost in the Caribbean, they're about, and statistics vary, but about 150 million native people in what is now North America. So 400 years later, there's about 230,000 of us left. So from 100 mil to 200,000, one of the greatest examples of cultural genocide or ethnic cleansing in the history of the world, all that took place right here in the good old U.S. of A. and with the direction and the blessing of the church. So Christianity's not really been good news. And so the way the gospel came to our people is you guys are sinners. Man, you're involved in paganism and witchcraft and you worship demons and your drums are of the devil and your dances are of the devil. And so when you become a Christian, you need to cut your hair and learn the guitar, learn the piano, and along, <laughs> stop your dancing so you can be good Christians. And along with that, learn our language, learn our culture, etc. So not really good news. And so we have historically been part of a replacement oriented theology where pastors and missionaries have said and say, because it's present tense too, we're Christians, you are not. Therefore, in order for you to become a Christian, all that you are must be replaced with all that we are. <laughs> when I first heard Corey Greaves speak, it hit me in the gut. This idea of replacement-oriented theology. That there is a right way, and throughout Christian history, largely the right way has been the white way. It's been the European form of the church, which by and large we particip participate in. And inherently, that's not problematic, the existence of a European-style church. What's problematic is the stripping of people of their identity in order to fit them into ours. And the church has not only sanctioned it, it has so often led the way. It's patronizing to think that, that we know the right way to follow Jesus. I say this having had to take all the exams to pastor the right way and to know the right theology to be a Presbyterian minister, but it is patronizing to think that what someone else who is different from us has to offer is any less of the image of God. Not only is it patronizing, it's threatening, and it actually robs people of their human dignity. And in the case of the Native Americans, justified genocide. We see this narrative 
in big and small ways throughout the history of the church. Us clinging so hard to tradition and to the way that we read scripture. Most recently with LGBTQIA rights, who can we love? Who is allowed to love who and what is sanctioned by God? In proclaiming that heterosexuality was the only way sanctioned by God, which is, of course, not what John Calvin Presbyterian Church believes, but for so long in the Presbyterian Church that was uh, in our orthodoxy, as part of our, our practice and our polity, it did not allow people to be fully and wholly themselves in church. And therefore, more likely than not, stunted their ability to feel whole and holy before God. So what does this have to do with us and how we approach God today? Jesus gave this man healing and direction. The man knew that God was, Jesus was the son of God, the most high, and he knew that he was healed and that was enough to share the good news. His body now, even though it was healed, would have represented a threat to the powers that be because of the power it took for Jesus to do that healing. But he was made whole in Jesus and that wholeness was meant to bring wholeness to others. When we seek the wholeness that God desires for us within the context of the church, we then are able to bring that wholeness to the world. We work hard not to exclude people from experiencing that wholeness at John Calvin, and we are in the process of working with the ideas of anti-racism with, within this sermon around um, coming to understand our part in the slaughter and diminishing of the Native Americans of this country, the indigenous peoples. We do all of this so that we also can be freed because we believe in Jesus and Jesus believes that freed people free people. So as you move into the week, I ask that you would consider when have you experienced being released? When have you experienced freedom in a new way? And how did it make you see the world differently? Toni Morrison once said, I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. This is not just a grab bag candy game. Right now in our world, we are being freed of worldviews that have led to oppression. We are being freed of racist ideas that have kept some people low and lifted up others who already had power. We are being freed of our demons and now through this work, we pray that we will re-enter the post-pandemic world changed. A taste of healing upon our tongues that will nourish us to speak the words that align ourselves with God the most high. And that God's power would be with us and working through us. Not the powers and principalities of our world and not those of our self-interest. Let us become healed, disciples of God, confessing and receiving forgiveness, 
receiving confession and giving forgiveness. Existing in a world in which it's okay that we are not perfect, but we try, as Maya Angelou says, and I've quoted before, to know better so that we can do better. May it be so. Amen. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Jesus am I my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. You are my strength when I am The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless you for creating the whole world, for your promises to your people Israel, and for Jesus Christ in whom your fullness dwells. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. Risen from the dead, he gives new life. Living with you, he prays for us. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. Receive our sacrifice and praise. Holy God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that this meal may be a communion of the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Christ and with all who share this feast. Unite us in faith, encourage us with hope, inspire us with love, that we may serve as your faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. We praise you, eternal God, through Christ your word made flesh in the holy and life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so now I invite you all to take what bread you have at home and to receive communion, the body of Christ together. In the same manner also he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so we lift our cup from our homes together, remembering God's body, God's blood poured out for us for our forgiveness. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this meal. Taken, enjoyed in our homes that unites us, not just to one another as a particular body of Christ at John Calvin Presbyterian, but to the whole body, the whole body of Christ in the world and throughout time. We ask that you would use these gifts, the bread, the cup to transform us, that we would be given the energy to be your body throughout this world. Amen.
Friends, God gives us more than enough for our journey of faith. Let us present our tithes and offerings so that others may know their blessings and give thanks to God. Triune God, through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, you bring hope to the despairing, healing to the sick, and release from bondage to all who are oppressed by sin and evil. Through baptism into Christ, you cover us with your love. We thank you that in that flood you wash away all that separates us from you and one another. We thank you that in this new life you are set free to proclaim good news to others. Direct our gifts to fulfill your purpose as we await the time when all creation is one in your love by the grace of Jesus Christ and the community of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Worship God alone, God of the prophets, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Spirit of the Holy One. Do not be overcome by evil powers. Trust God, who even the powers must obey. Rejoice in your salvation by loving others, to the glory of God, who is three, who is one. God, feed you. Christ, protect you. Spirit, live in you and wash over you with the love of God. Amen. <laughs>